I'm at the right place in the right time, and I'm kind of grateful to all the forces, uh, the greater forces out there that have made it possible for me to be here. So what I want to talk about today are kind of, there are, three, there are lots of big words here, and there are lots of words that mean nothing or can mean something. And I always think the best way to start any kind of presentation is to talk about the definitions of things that matter. Now, I should tell you before I start that my slides here are really more an aid for me to remember where to go and not get lost rather than information for you. However, they're useful in case you fall asleep, you wake up, you can have a quick read, uh, and you will catch up with where, where I'm going to or where I've been, and then you can feel like you've, you know, that your money has not been uh, wasted. Uh, so I want to start with the word globalization. And for me, this is, uh, this is the last 30 years. And this is a, a globalization for me has a specific definition. It means the growing interdependence of markets for good services and capital. This is how, what it means, growing or increasing interdependence. And the word is interdependence. It's very important to differentiate this from dependence. Now, I don't have to explain this to, in this room, that what I mean by interdependence, but the thing about interdependence is that you cannot, uh, you cannot break the relationship without damaging both actors. There, there is a symbiosis taking place between the different actors, and that's where what globalization has, has done. Now, this is a good thing, and, or a bad thing, depending upon who you talk to, and that's sort of, in a way, the conversation that's going on today. The second word here is nationalism, and this is what is rearing its, its ugly head currently, and I think it's an ugly head, and we see Trump, we see trade war with China, we see trade war with Japan, we see trade war with, and fill in the blank here. Uh, you wake, every morning I wake up and he's picked a fight with somebody else. We see Brexit, uh, we see China posturing in different ways, we see trouble in Hong Kong, we see uh, increasing inequality in society. I'm in South Africa, I don't have to explain this uh, to you. And of course, people are saying, well, this is a cause of globalization. No, we need to look inwards. And this looking inwards uh, is kind of the basis of the last 70 years of the world economy has been on the principle that, that if we trade, that globalization works on the principle that if we trade, both of us will come out uh, on average better off. Now, the key word here is on average that some people will lose and some people will win. That's what it means by on average. And we've accepted, I think, tacitly accepted for the last 70 years that this is true, that on average everything will work out and people on the long run as well will do fine. Now people are saying, wait a minute, this average is not working for us. We don't want to be on the wrong side of the average, you know? So this is really where, in a sense, I put it simply, is where the question of, of nationalism rises. That in the old days, when we closed everything up, when we didn't have globalization, we were better off. Now, whether this is true or not, but people believe this, that there was, Mr. Trump believes this, that when America was an island, so to speak, uh, this was better for everyone, that there was, everybody had a station wagon, everybody had a barbecue, everybody had a job, and everybody was white. So, you know, these were, <laughs> these were this is sort of, you know, I'm, 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 I jest, but you see where I'm going with this. And this, was, uh, this is where we are uh, today, and we're gonna talk about that. The other thing I wanna talk about is leadership, and I know this leadership thing, <laughs> for me, leadership is, is a very complex thing, and that's why I put on the lack thereof, because we're not quite clear where we are. So we, so 20, uh, the, the way the world has functioned thus far is that they're politicians and they're technocrats. Um, sometimes they're called civil servants, but the point has always been that you have experts and you have politicians. Now this, this pact has driven, at least Western society and countries that have been influenced by Western society for the last couple of hundred years. This is crumbling when you hear people saying, wait a minute, we don't want to hear from experts anymore. The world is tired of experts. Uh, this is Brexit. I'm quoting one of the major politicians in the UK, uh, current prime minister, saying, we're tired of experts. Now, wait a minute. What was the point of experts if you're going to ignore them? Trump has decided to ignore all of his experts. This is a, not a small phenomena. And we can go around the world. I mean, I, picking on these two countries, but there, we can see this happening you know, everywhere we go. In India, China, you know, and so on. We see these things where experts are getting marginalized because 
being an expert is an insult almost, you know, in some ways. So this is where we come to. And, and it's really kind of something that, that bothers me. Uh, it's, this is a philosophical question. I'm not going to answer these questions, by the way. Uh, I'm just here to make you think. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, uh, I, one of the stories, I, I, at one point in my life, I read a lot of Sufism. And there's a story about uh, Mullah Nasruddin. If you, anyone's familiar with, uh, no, who Mullah Nasruddin is a famous character, and they use him to tell, make a point. You know, he tells. So Mullah Nasruddin is walking down the road, and he sees this, this lawn, perfect lawn, green as can be. Every blade of grass was like right length. It just looked beautiful. And he stopped and he stared at it, and he said, and he saw a gardener, and he said, "How did you do this?" And the guy says, nothing to it. He said, will you tell me? He said, of course, it's no secret. It's very easy. All you have to do is plant the lawn. You have to cut the grass, water it carefully, roll it every day for 500 years. And you too can have a lawn like this. <laughs> and the guy says, I prefer my cement floor. And this is the thing about, pol about policy making and about leadership is that a lot of things have a lo are long term. Things don't happen because you planted the seeds today that you will have day after tomorrow or a year or two or five or ten. You will necessarily have the outcome. The reason why that lawn happened was 500 years of careful monitoring. So this brings me to the, and I, I have a tendency to wander, so I may rush through some of these slides because I've suddenly remembered something else. Where I started off, so in, in, when I started, when I decided to do a PhD and it was a deliberate choice, I went to the States to do my PhD, and I uh, happened to be, uh, at that time, the big thing was Japan. How can we stop Japan from taking over the world? Just like nowadays, you're hearing about China. Now, at that time, the thing was Japan. Everybody wanted to know how and why we are all going to learn how to speak Japanese, and we're going to be, everything will be Japanese. There was this paranoia, which we now have about uh, China. And, you know, so I, so the, I always thought, yes, how did they do this in 150 years? And so I started reading, and I'm still reading, and I go to Japan regularly, and I'm fascinated by the Japanese thing. And, you know, there's a, there was a mission. In 1854, uh, Com Commodore Perry opened up Japan, and, he, uh, and so he forced them at gunpoint to, to, to globalize, to join the, you know, to ha trade with everybody. We must trade with you. You have to open up your country. So long, so I won't go to that part, but they decided, okay, now when they realized when Commodore Perry came with his guns and said, open up or else I start shooting, literally, uh, they opened up. And they realized that, frankly, they couldn't fight this one ship that had come in, that they had to modernize quickly or else they would be left behind in the, in the, in the, in the dumpster of, of nations, you know, they would be at the bottom of everything. So they decided they were going to change everything. And they decided, how are we going to change everything? And they sent around a mission of people to go around the world to what they thought at that time, the civilized nations of the world, and look at best practice. And they did two or three of these. And then there's one of these, uh, they produced these reports of obser observing people. And this is a page from one of these reports, the Iwakara Embassy of 1870. One to 73, two years they traveled. In those days there were no aircraft. And this is a summary part of it. And this is, I know I found this fascinating. And he, they're obsessed with the roads. They go around and the roads and the canals and the transportation. And the guy says, and I've highlighted it, the essential purpose of roads and waterways is not simply to enable people to move. It is to facilitate the transportation of all the goods produced to places where the value is higher. Now, we understand the kind of the, the where globalization, today's globalization comes from. And then he says, this is, you know, translated from the Japanese. Our circulatory system keeps us in good health by keeping nutrition to every part of the body. The slightest blockage at any point will inevitably cause sickness and will eventually impair the well-being of the whole. Consequently, all the countries of Europe devote great effort to construction and maintenance of their roads and waterways. Countries which have done so gradually attained wealth and power. We found that we traveled through a particular country the conditions of its roads would reveal to us immediately whether its government was vigorous or in decline. Now, substitute roads uh, and waterways, you know, we're 20, because the next paragraph starts talking about the arrival of wind power and electricity, because it was a new concept. 
Now, substitute that now, a hundred and something years later, and we're talking about the internet, we're talking about technology, we're talking about different stuff, but the fundamental principle is exactly the same. So if you read through the book, and I have it on PDF uh, somewhere, it explains every time they look at the road and they say, how can a man, you know, there's a sentence here, you know, where he says, says uh, by use of a wheeled vehicle on a smooth level road, the same amount of energy can move a weight 10 times greater. And it's a very simple observation, but it is very profound. It changes the power of technology, the power of knowledge. And you know, this is what it comes down to, that you think through your actions your, you, as a leader. We'll come back to the leadership thing. This is what their leaders, they went and the information they collected and they took it back to Japan and they implemented it. That's the most important. And they planted the grass and waited 100 years. Japan did not happen since 1945. Japan happened from 1873. This happened first. They went and did this, they went back and they did it. And by 1905, they were a world power. Nobody remembers this because there was a couple of wars in the middle. But that was a fundamental thing. And this is really, for me, it's like we can, you know, there's no shame in learning from other people. One looks at one's, you know, leadership. What are you going to look at? Closing up, you, you have to accept the reality that the world has opened up. That's what the Japanese realize. They can't close and pretend to be a closed economy. It's not available to anyone. You have to be North Korea to do that. Nobody else can do that. So how do you, if you're going to open up, practically speaking, how are we going to succeed in, in, this, in this situation? And that's where, you know, in a way, where I'm going with this uh, talk. But now we're going to come back to the 21st uh, century. Uh, and, you know, I may have said some of these things. So slides, will, you know, as I said earlier on, I'm making it up as I go along. So, you know, the first one I've made already, you know, it's on average. We don't necessarily, we're not ready for this. this, this uh, we we look, countries are looking around and saying, where is the money coming from? And this is what, you know, one of the key points is that, yes, how do we, what do we do about this? And freeing up trade and investments, and, you know, it has its cost. Now, uh, what we are seeing is increase in imbalances. We are seeing increase in inequalities. Um, and, but the, one of the key things is the power of the state to act within the domestic economy. The, the country, any country, it doesn't matter which country, the, you have limited access, to, uh, limited control over your own economy. So I just was in Durban and I met this fairly wealthy character who's an international businessman. He says to me, I'm moving to Mauritius. I said, why? He said, they're going to tax my, glo my, my global income now. So yes, you want to increase the income, the, the revenues of taxes, but the outcome is not going to be increased revenue. This guy is going to be in Mauritius from next year onwards. And I think, okay, so the power to tax your own people has actually changed. The power to, you know, because of globalization, we have this movement type of thing. So, you know, so some people say it's time to get off this carousel. You know, is it an unstoppable force? No, you can slow it down. You can possibly stop it as well. But it's not a buffet where you can only have the benefits and none of the costs. This is kind of the punchline that I, I want to come to. And what I'm focusing on, I bring, come back to my, my lawn and I come back uh, to the Japanese story of the waterways, is that it's about knowledge infrastructure. It's about creating the capacity for people to generate ideas and utilize them. It's not enough to have an idea. You have to generate the capacity also to utilize them. That comes down to people. I mean, this is if you're going to leave early, this is a key message. It's the people. It's the people. If you don't have the people with the right knowledge and the capacity to, to they will be frustrated if they are not able to express that. Everyone has creativity in them. You know, if they're not starving, they're, even starving people are creative. They have to be if they're not, you know, because from starving to dead is not a big jump. You find a way to be creative. So, but how do you increase the odds of them being successful, or at least leveraging their, the power of their mind? So, the bad news is, you gotta pay for this stuff. How do governments pay for this? I'm not gonna answer this. I, I would get the Nobel Prize if I could solve this equation, by the way. So, you need public goods. You need to have, I want to build the roadways and the waterworks and all these type of things. And who's gonna pay for that? The state would like to pay for it, may have wanted to pay for it, but it's not available because they can't tax people in the same way as they could have taxed them in the past. You have re limited resources. I read the Daily Maverick. There are lots of problems here with money going on. Every, everyone seems to want a handout from the government. How many places do you hand things out? 
So the other way around this is bring people from abroad. You bring in, you know, foreign knowledge, which also works. I mean, if you go to places in the, some places in the world, like Singapore, they've relied on everybody, bringing the best talent from everywhere. This is what the UK has done to some extent. They've brought people from abroad. But then you have to allow immigration. Uh, we know immigration has its, creates all kinds of new interesting problems. So what we know, uh, the simple roots of, uh, of, uh, of nationalism, increasing inequality, insecurity of employment. Uh, the days have gone when, well, maybe there are still some places where you can get a job and stay there till you, till you retire. But increasingly, this is now you know, a flash in the pan. And the number of people who can do this, I know that my contract has changed. It's no longer you know, lifetime employment. It's as long as they need me. Um, so I have to keep myself relevant. And I know people who you, know, you get laid off. It happens. Uh, pension. Every time I look, my pension has changed. Uh, you know, oh, we can't afford to pay you at 65. You have to wait till 75 or 78. Or we're going to give you this much money and then we're going to tax it. And then I realize there's no way I can retire. I'm going to keep working. Um, there's structural unemployment. I'm going to talk about that later on. Uh, and for the wrongly skilled, they are, they are not living, living wages. You know, if you have the wrong set of skills, you are, you can, that's a part of the structural unemployment thing. And the social safety net, which we relied on, like, oh, you know, I had to tell my, my father, he said, ah, you can get, you, if you, you know, you can always go and get unemployment. No, have you seen how little unemployment people get nowadays? No, there's no, there are no such things. NHS, you go and queue up, it's, you know, you have to wait in line and for an operation if you need one and so on. You know, the government has limited money. And you have a dissatisfied public. Whose fault is it? I worked hard. I did everything my father did, or better than my father. And I'm not as well off as my father. Why is that? And there is a certain amount of uh, dissatisfaction. I mean, my father was a school teacher. And it wasn't particularly, you know, he was very satisfied because he did much better than his father. I have, feel I have been more successful than him, but, you know, he retired at 55. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's now at 85 and he's, you know, been living fairly comfortably. And I think, I can't afford a house. He said, why don't you buy a house? I said, I live in London. How can I afford a house? It's impossible. Not on my salary. So you see the, the kind of the, so this satisfaction. So my, I'm satisfied with my life. But when I talk to my father, I become dissatisfied. Like, come on, shut up, man. I don't want to hear about what you did when you said you, you should have a car. Uh, you know, I, come on, no. But so that's what happens to people. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating for, purpose, for effect, of course. But you see what I'm trying to go with this. This is a, in a way where we come at the grassroots level of, of, of nationalism. Now, 30 years. We've had 30 years where everything has been growing fascinatingly fast. Incomes have been growing, opportunities have been growing. We are able to do so many wonderful things. We have, you know, uh, uh, we have, we can fly anywhere for almost no money. You know, you can pop over for a holiday to London. It's 11 hours away. It's not, it's, you're not taking the boat anymore. And you can actually get a budget flight for almost nothing. Uh, you can go to Amazon and all your stuff. You can watch a movie. You're bored, you know, what the hell? Let's watch another movie. Uh, and you can see another episode of Friends. You know, these type of things. Hotels, I, I am, I'm using a credit card from another country. I don't have to worry about, I've never, no, I don't have to do that. How, where can I change my money? What are the interest rates? What are the exchange rates? Internet banks, insurance, all these things, you know, we have these, all these wonderful things. So they, all ICT, we talk about these things. But the key thing about, about globalization, and people don't get this, is it has three legs. We obsess, as I said, my definition earlier on, for the movement of goods and services and movement of capital, which is FDI, loans, uh, remittances. And, but the third leg is movement of people. Everybody seems to have missed this particular point because we have globalization and people are moving. I mean, here, as I said, here I am, you know, uh, without much difficulty. 11 hours later, I'm, 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 I'm here. So <clears throat> we have movement of people. I mean, we won't have to explain this to you, this crowd. We have lots of other things happening. We have biotech, we have CRISPR. If you, anyone knows uh, anything about biotech, it's all about CRISPR nowadays. Tra logistics, software, transportation, all of these thing, wonderful things have happened. So this has been a, a good thing for us. Uh, but not all the growth is coming from technology. People think about technology. A lot of growth we have seen in the last 30 years come from China. Not China because it's growing, but China because in the GDP of the world, 
China was zero in 1979. So if every Chinese person consumes $10 and he had a billion Chinese people, suddenly the world economy increased by this massive amount. And as they have grown, they have become larger and larger. But it started from nothing. You see the liberalization that took place in the 1980s, places like India suddenly opened up, people started consuming much more. They were suddenly adding another uh, few trillion to the world economy everywhere in the world suddenly. And then we had the end of the, then we had privatization. Everything got privatized. Suddenly an asset that had no value has, an as has a value. You know, the hotels, the airline, uh, whatever, the government sells things off hospitals, this gets, this becomes liquid, it, becomes, it adds to the liquidity of the economy. And then you had uh, what I, uh, I, then I see money, you see money move from blue to gray to white. Uh, so black, not blue, black to gray to white. Why? Because people are, it's harder and harder to keep your money under your mattress, so people, the money comes out, so you don't eat, you know, comes out of the system. People start, are able to mortgage their house, I mean, people didn't know the value of the house, but now you can go and borrow money on your grandfather's house, which had zero value. It wasn't counted in the books of anything. The moment you borrow money against it, it has a value, it enters the economy. So a lot of growth comes from things that we don't actually pay attention to. So a lot of the growth came from all of these places. And, and uh, you know, suddenly people have never taken a loan before can borrow money. Uh, we have created systems for people to borrow money, and more money, a multiplier effect, you know, and this has grown the economy. But you get to a point where there's nothing left to mortgage, uh, or there's less and less to mortgage, there's less and less to sell. How many airlines are left? South African Airways is on, not yet on sale, Air India not yet on sale, but, you know, but you see what I mean, there's limited assets you can now throw into the, to, to grow the economy further. Of course, we have governance mechanism that allows this to happen, we have regional integration, we have WTO, we have industry coordination standards, the reason why my phone works wherever I go, the reason why we are able to move uh, uh, technology, I can use my credit card wherever I go, the same PIN number works. Why? Because we have decided to coordinate all these technologies. So we see all these things leading to transaction costs falling, we see transportation costs falling, we see enforcement costs, you know, now I, you know, someone takes money out of my account, I will know immediately, you know, it's like, well, you see it on your phone, well, money disappeared, you know, my, my girlfriend has borrowed my credit card, damn it. So, you know these things immediately. Coordination costs in one penny, one cent for make a phone call. You know, I, I'm old enough to remember going to the post office and saying, I need to talk to someone in so country for three minutes, pay, pay in front. Oh, okay, and it's only for three minutes. You go to the post office, you give them the money and you get your three minutes and you're paid what is essentially 10% of your salary for a three minute phone call. Now I just don't even think about it. There's WhatsApp, I don't even pay for the phone call. It seems like that at least. So this is all the good things that have happened in globalization, you know. Uh, and, but actually the distribution of benefits has favored the multinational more than it has most developing countries, not all developing and not all parts of society. We know the multinational has been growing, multinationals, and, if, and the same multinationals, actually, the world is dominated by 300 multinationals. The total foreign direct investment in the world is 70% of it is 300 firms. And the number of new firms that have entered the world economy that are major, that have a large role to play are very, very few. Uh, and they are coming from less than 20, 20 countries have benefited from globalization on average. Again, I have to be careful what I say. The rest have not. Now, now what we see also is that something that has happened, the multinationals have shifted towards services. We can see this rapid growth of the world economy in this, what we call the service sector. There's something wrong with the way we classify things. And we see the slicing of, of value chains. When, there are very few companies that do everything for themselves. They do outsource, they do alliances, they cooperate. They, they, and this is because we can coordinate things much more effectively. I'm not going to go into that. But the thing is that coordination costs don't reduce over time. So firms think they can grow and they can expand and they can do more and more stuff. But actually the cost is, goes up. It doesn't fall. I was talking to a friend yesterday who's, work, who's doing some work for Old Mucho which has its own uh, interesting uh, soap opera going on. Um, and uh, she was telling me that the insurance companies are expanding to Nigeria. 
and uh, they're going to this, uh, they're thinking that, you know, of course, they, are, they can play a big role in the African continent. And she said, but they've got it wrong. They're thinking that they can pretend Nigeria is the same as South Africa. So they're using the same uh, tables, the risk tables, as they are for South Africans. Now, I don't know if this is true or not. Uh, there might be experts in the room. But you start realizing that, yes, this is, so you can leverage yourself, but you then, you also your costs are going up because you can't do that. You end up having to do your own tables for individual countries. But you also have to deal with new regulators in every country. You also have to deal with uh, universities or companies or governments or competitors or suppliers. And you have all this network of people. At every place you go, you have to, your cost goes up because you're going to do more and more of this coordination for each country that you enter. So, uh, so it multiplies. And the more countries you get into, the more costly it gets for you. You have to be very efficient about moving your resources to be effective. And of course, the key thing here is how do I lower my cost? The best way to lower your cost is to get rid of people, get rid of machines, get rid of whatever you can, simplify your life. So expanding internationally doesn't necessarily mean they employ more people. We'll come to that. Uh, so what matters for a firm? We are in a business school, so I have to talk about the firm a little bit. Size still matters. Being big is still important. But the key remains the same, where we started from upgrading of, of, your, uh, of your assets and promoting innovation. You have to stay up front. You can't be one year behind in the technology cycle. You have to be up front because the global world, things are moving. So, but local presence hasn't changed. You can't replace this with Technology, there's only a limit to how far you can replace it with technology. Uber thinks they can replace all the people with uh, driverless cars. It's going to take 25 years. They haven't seemed to realize this, and none of the investors have worked this out, that this, uh, that this is not a, a viable model. But local presence matters. You need to deal with regulators, you need to deal with institutions, you need to deal with all kinds of uh, complicated things. The skill of coordinating it is not a straightforward thing. Learning how to coordinate things across borders is incredibly difficult. And most importantly, find the right kind of skilled people is very difficult. Now, I'm talking to some people uh, in India, and we think India has a billion and a half people. Companies find it difficult finding qualified people. Now, it's not about that it's a degree, it's about getting the right kinds of skills. And there's a shortage of the right kinds of skills. It's a global shortage. And the thing is now people will move to fill in whatever hole that pays the best, whatever slot you can find. You know, why would I take the best paying job in South Africa when I have now a global world where I can take the best paying job anywhere in the world? If you have the right kind of skills, you'll be moved. And there's an example I sometimes give. There's a, a Dutch company 20, 25 years ago called um, uh, Fokker Aircraft Manufacturers. Some of you are old enough to remember flying in a Fokker aircraft. And uh, they went bankrupt at some point in time, and uh, nobody was willing to bail them out. So they decided they, you know, they were put up for sale. And within 24 hours of the of their government saying anyone wants to make an offer for the company, Boeing had flown over two cargo aircraft and a recruitment team. And within 72 hours, they had hired the best engineers of Fokker, put everything they owned on the cargo planes. They brought a guy from the INS who gave them their visa on the spot and shipped them out to Seattle. They were all the best minds were in Seattle before the week was done. They had found schools for them, houses for them, and they had moved them. And so when they were trying to sell the company, there was nothing left to sell. They were just parts. They sold uh, the part company to a company called Stork, but there was nothing left. What was key was the people, the best designers, the best aircraft engineers in the world that Fokker had were in Seattle. There was nothing left, it was a shell. So this is the thing, you know, we're in a global world. This is what happens. It's not a, you know, you don't sit, slow down. So a multinational is very hard to do it well. You know, it's very hard to be there. You need to move people, move resources quickly. And the larger the multinational, the more the complexity and the more costly it gets. So you have this kind of, Paradox in a way, you're getting and making things by doing in many countries, but you're also getting more cost. And then there are power struggles within the organization, so it's not an easy thing. This is a typical type of thing where you look at partnerships taking place. This is just one company's partnerships in, in, in innovation in microelectronics. 
and the yellow line means at least seven agreements between those two firms. And then different colors tell you. What I want to show you is the number of partnerships this one company has in one area of technology. Just keeping track of all of your, your friends. Uh, this is like, uh, this is about four or five hundred partnerships in this one picture. Can you see the administrative cost of, just administrative cost? of keeping track. Then you have the regulatory cost, then you have the IP cost. How do you work out how much I've shared with whom? So partnerships are not the solution. Brexit, perfectly good example of the whole story. The uh, cost of globalization, inequality, there's a gig economy. People, as I said, don't, aren't doing as well as they wanted to do, not sure where they're going with life, poor quality of jobs, loss of lifetime employment, fewer benefits, all of these things are exactly the same things that are happening in the UK. And uh, again, they are always thinking, yes, we, we want it the way it used to be. We want to have an NHS that paid for everything. We want to have a, a uh, railway system that was almost free to travel on. We would like to have all of these things, free schools, free universities. But who's going to pay for them? The government cannot pay. So the natural thing is they, people look around and say, yes, but there's an Indian guy there, there's a Chinese guy, there's a Nigerian guy there. They're doing jobs. Why can't, why aren't any British people doing this job? And the answer is they're wrongly skilled. The locals are wrongly skilled for the job. So this is the best person in the world for the job. So that's not an answer people want to hear. It's like, no, damn it. I am, why is that guy working and I am not working? Uh, this is not a rational thing. Like We wanted to go, then it was much better in the days when everybody had a job and we can take it back to that. And of course, the, the question comes down always is immigration people. Maybe we should have these people go home and everything will be solved. EU is entirely the fault of the Czechs and the Slovaks and the Germans who are running our factories and sitting in, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So this government can't do anything. They have to raise the tuition fees. We have to make people pay for railways. You pay ridiculous amounts and so on and so forth. So, the Brexit seemed a natural outcome. What do you do? Blame the, blame the people of, you know, EU. Blame the European Commission for having done this to us. If we hadn't had to pay 450 million a week, we would be able to do so many wonderful things. Uh, and of course, now we are finding out that it's not going to work out. Uh, and anyone who had any common sense knew this already, but they're experts, so we don't need to know from them. So. Now everyone says, well, now we can look to China. China is the next superpower. Yes, but that doesn't mean they're going to save you. And I say you, I mean everybody, we. Uh, the can, uh, emerging countries, can developing countries look to, to uh, China? The answer is no, China is looking after itself. Uh, they're not in the business of economic development. They're not in the business of saving anybody else. And China is slowing down. One of the key things about growth is that it has a very unique shape. And it's, this has been true since the beginning of time. And it looks like this. And this is what we call an asymptotic graph. That is to say, you know, you start off from here and so your growth is very slow. And you get to a certain point, a threshold level of knowledge and infrastructure and development. And then you are able to imitate very easily. And you can imitate and grow up to here. And then slowly the growth becomes like this. Now China has come to this point. So I'm not saying it's going to become flat. I'm drawing this for illustration. But this is where we see Europe is. This is where we see Japan is. And you come to this point. And you can, because now you can no longer imitate. It's easy to, it's like going to learn how to read. Once you learn how to read, you go to the library, you have 100,000 books at your disposal. But writing a book, requires fundamentally different skills and different abilities. That's when you, are, you get to the point you can imitate, you can read everyone else's book. When you come to write your own book, you're not going to write you know, 100,000 books. You're going to be lucky. I would, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years. I only have 15 books. This takes a long time to put yourself into circulation. So, you know, and it takes, you know, I tell my mother, I write a page a day. That's it. That's the best I can do. Two pages on a good day, maybe three. So that becomes more and more hard. So my next additional thing, it becomes harder and harder. This is not just true for, for companies or countries. It's true for individuals as well. Learning that marginal thing at some point in time becomes more and more difficult. 
And that is in the way where China is coming to. India is a little bit further behind. Other countries are behind as well. But we have this trend. This is called, this is called a middle income trap. You get to this point where things start slowing down. So you can't rely on China to save. So will China lead? I think the answer is clear. They will lead themselves. Uh, they, are, they are not looking to lead anybody else. You know, we can't go around looking for saviors. Consumption. You can't, they cannot, nobody grows on, how much can you consume? I mean, go to one mall, you go to another mall, how many shirts can you own? Uh, you get to a point when, okay, it's enough, uh, and you are a replacement. I'm in the replacement business, you know. When a shirt dies, I have a funeral, I buy a new shirt. That's it. And I go on to buy, you know, I might buy a second shirt, but I'm not going to buy 15 shirts. You know, I might have bought 15 shirts when I was 25, but that's not going to happen. So we are at this point. We are also in the consumption thing. We are, we are slowing down our consumption. So, you know, so how do we kickstart the world economy. More consumption, more sales, uh, more uh, buying. No, we can't get people to buy more. People are not going to buy more. You reach a point when they've reached, how many things can you buy? The poor people don't have the money, inequality. Where do you pay, where do you pay for, get them to say, okay, you should buy a car. You're going to a township and say, buy a car. Come on, it's not my problem here. I want, I have other pressing uh, things. So how do you push more? In India, the number, the, the, the factories are shutting down the car factories, because the demand for cars has fallen, They've rapidly fallen in the last one year. Nobody, the people who are going to buy cars have bought cars. The people who don't, cannot buy cars will not be buying cars. <laughs> so, the, you know, and replacement, how many times do you replace? You can't replace your car. So everybody, the middle class has bought cars. The working class can't afford to buy cars. So we are, they're stuck in this place. And now you're seeing the slow. Indian government is throwing money at trying to reboot the economy uh, in the same way as uh, everybody else. And of course, they're also doing nationalism now. It's no, not our fault. It's those foreigners who are doing it to us. So the two things that no one wants to deal with is sovereignty, because you're losing sovereignty. Decisions aren't being made in, in Pretoria or New Delhi or in Beijing. They are being made elsewhere. Your life is being determined by, by other people. And it's not a bad thing, you know, frankly. Uh, you know, think about being married, you know. Uh, um, and some of you may relate to this, some of you may not. But anyway, I'll leave it there. And the second, uh, second thing that nobody wants to deal with is free movement of people. How do we create this? How do we find a legitimate way to move people around? Because people are going to move. You're not going to stop them. You can't put up electric fences. This is, no, Merkel is right. You can't, how long can you block people from coming? So either you fix where they're coming from or you open your border and learn how to deal with it. But this is all a very complicated set of issues. And this is where we are right now in many, many countries. Trump is doing the same thing, you know, electrify fences, shoot the children, everything where people will stop coming. You know, but uh, I'm not exaggerating. I'm, you know, my, my words could be slightly better, but anyway. so. How do we deal with, with cross-border sovereignty, cross-border regulation? Nobody wants regulation saying, okay, this is what the British are saying. No, no, we don't want Brussels to tell us what to do. Or, uh, you know, N N Nigeria, take, you know, they echo us. They want to dominate echo us. They've tried, been dominating echo us for the last 50 years since echo us came around. But the rest of the countries don't like it. And they have never liked it. So, you know, yes, but we will decide the rules, you know, because the big boy in the pack always decides the rules. So in, it's on Mercosur, it's Brazil or Argentina that decide the rules. In the EU, it's Germany and France that decide the rules, and so on and so forth. Uh, but whose rules do you accept? The Americans are not happy now that China can say, well, we, have the, we know the rules now. We are big. We can also make the rules. And the, Huawei is a perfect example of that. They are leading the technology when it comes to telecoms. They are, they are making the rules. The 5G is entirely, you know, Chinese are ahead by one year from everybody else. So the, every, the 5G will be a Chinese dominated technology. But now if you put out Huawei from the whole thing, everybody, you know, will this solve the problem? No, it won't solve it. The temporary slowing down. So that's where we are. And we're looking at this and how can we solve this? If, no, again, Nobel Prize, I don't have the answer to this. And this is where we're coming. How do we deal with structural unemployment on a global level? How does the government deal with it? You have bicycle repairmen. How do the bicycle repairmen suddenly get another job? What jobs are available? IT, 
you know, can you, uh, can you install Windows 10? No, I can repair your bicycle. No, but can you install Windows 10? What use are you? You know, uh, IT specialists, I put Fortran, because when I went to university, Fortran was the language to learn. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really good at Fortran, but what use is it on the market today? Python, what's Python? Ah, it's a snake. No, I don't know what to do with it. You know, I have no idea. I look at, I look at, the, I look at the syntax and say, this makes no sense. How the hell do you use this? Um, I don't program anything anymore. And nobody would want to hire me. So we have these issues of structural unemployment. We need new training. How do you train these people? How do I train somebody who's my father's age to do a different job? Or my age, to I forget how old I am sometimes. You know, uh, and say, no, my brother-in-law is unemployed. He's an advertising executive. What, he doesn't want to go and start at, at, you know, at $1,000 a month. He wants to earn what he made at the height of his career. He doesn't want to go and learn a new skill. He doesn't want to learn Windows 10 uh, and, then, and get paid uh, you know, slightly above minimum wage. He's too proud for that. What can you do about it? You can't do anything. Uh, uh, so how do you change these things? Now, we don't need the, you know, you understand where I'm going with this. What's the new minimum? The days when you went to school and got a high school diploma and that was considered to be enough for you to spend the rest of your life, that's gone. You know, but if you want to make universities, are we going to do the university system like we did that you got one degree and you, you used it for the rest of your life? That's no longer the case. You have to keep updating yourself. Otherwise, you're going to be unemployed. So it's even more complicated in developing countries because we have the movement from the countryside to the city. This is uh, something, you, you know, South Africa you are familiar with. Rural to urban. Uh, by, by 2050, 70% of the world will live in cities. People are leaving, farmers are leaving because you're trying to sell your sugar cane. But the market for sugar, you can barely make it, you can barely live on it or whatever commodity you are producing. People are moving uh, to the cities. Wait, what do they do? I think you all know, they do nothing. They are unemployed. They're sitting around and they're twiddling their thumbs and, you know, not, and, now, and of course they're getting angry with who? Uh, the people who, the, the man and the other foreigners around them, ah, you've got my job, how are you doing this? Uh, and so on and so forth. It doesn't pick a country. I, you can, you know, Nigeria did it to the Ghanaians when the good old days, and other Ghanaians are doing it to the Nigerians. Uh, go home. Uh, so, we eliminate rural jobs through global trade, so there's a cost of the globalization, and, but we don't have anything to do with the people anymore, because on average, you remember where we were, on average, everything is fine, but on average, this, the people in the city are not happy. They're sitting around you know, doing nothing. You don't have the skills to survive, and the government hasn't got the infrastructure to support them, the, in, the public goods to support them. So an investment doesn't go to the rural area, it goes to the urban area. Look around here, look at Santon, I mean, uh, um, uh, and so on. So, you know, the city, you've got to do something. Uh, you can hold people up, or you can do something, get education costs money. Someone has to pay for it. Uh, housing costs money, water costs money, um, and the government has to tax people to do it. They tax people, then the people who are paying the taxes leave the country. So it's a balancing act. How do you tax people just the right amount that they don't leave, uh, but continue to invest? Because this guy tells me he has a $7 billion portfolio in Africa, and, uh, and he's not interested in investing in South Africa. He's invested in Nigeria, which is an unusual case. He has, you know, he has 700 million in Nigeria, he has 1 billion in Ghana, and so on but he's not investing in South Africa. He said, no, I don't want to be taxed on my global income and some other issues he has with the government. So, but anyway, but what we have with the development side is that people are coming to cities and we have an informal economy, a growing informal economy. South Africa, what? I, I am not yet familiar with the numbers. This is one reason I'm here. In India, 80% of the economy is informal. In Bangladesh, it's 90-something percent. That means 90% are not, uh, are not, the government doesn't know anything about them. They have, uh, they have there's, they're, they're not, they're not uh, paying taxes, but they're also not covered by labor standards or regulation or health and safety or uh, schools or water supply. The government is planning without knowing where they are. They, they have nothing to, no, they're outside the economy. They're informal. So if you've got 50% of the economy or 40% or 20%, so 
you know, there's one thing about working in a gig economy that's you can be, you know, I don't pay taxes on it, you know, I cover, uh, tax avoidance. That's different. Informal workers have no rights. Informal workers, informal factories, you can never get big. If you're an informal factory, what do you do? You have people working for you, but they don't have any insurance. They don't have any, uh, any resources. You want to grow, you can't borrow money because you have to be registered as a company. If you go and register a company, in Egypt, it takes five years to register a company. So you don't register the company. There, there are 80 steps in the process of registering a company. So you don't register, you stay small. And the economy doesn't grow because why would I hire anybody except my brother and sister because they, they won't cheat me and I have no, but that's a, my company will never be more than three people or five people. And in India, there's a, they have a law that also prevents people hiring, so people don't grow. So you get to a certain cut of 100 people, you don't employ 101 person, you open a new factory with a new registration, so you start growing them from that. So never, no company gets bigger than 100. So you never have scale economies. Now, these are real things. I, I mean, I can go through multiple countries and multiple examples, but each of you I know in this room is already coming up with your own stories here. So how do you deal with this inform? I, again, it's not something I'm going to answer. So, you know, and then we turn to say, oh, yeah, we have to get educated. We train our people. How do you train them? They're private schools. But, you know, how are they going to pay for the private school? Inequality is going to increase. So, you know, uh, there's brain drain. This is what happens. I mean, we are, I think it's, this is not a, don't explain this to you. Uh, the, the smartest and the brightest people from the developing world, uh, from the poor countries, which have not benefited from globalization, are moving to the rich countries. I know, I have my education, my undergraduate education was paid for by the Nigerian government. You know, uh, where am I working? I'm working in the UK. Uh, I have a huge amount of my friends, medical doctors drain in Nigeria, practicing in South Africa, in everywhere else in the world, but not in Nigeria. So, so this is uh, really, you know, so while the West is under investing in education, they had the benefit of all of the people like me turning up and saying, oh, I'm, I'm happy to work here. So without paying for my education, they get the, the return on the investment. And then they can get Slovaks, they get South Africa, and get everybody comes and they solve the problem. So they have less of a, the consequence of glo negative globalization is less for them. It's a movement of people. You're coming back to the third leg of globalization again. It's a movement of people. It's solving the problem, but it's also creating the problem. So investment also follows. So it kind of just becomes a vicious cycle. You see where I'm going again with that. So how do you get people to change? And so before coming, uh, I know I was looking half asleep. Uh, my mama will, will, will uh, attest to this. But I was reading the Iwakara Embassy, the thing that the Japanese report that I was talking about at the beginning. And well, in the chapter, they go to, they go to Germany. Uh, they went, this is Prussia, not Germany. And uh, Bismarck was running the country, he was a chancellor. And the Kaiser and the crown prince, uh, you know, and, the, the, and it was an uneasy relationship, according to them. The Kaiser and the crown prince had ideas, but, um, but the country was being run by uh, von Bismarck. And von Bismarck, uh, there was always this fight between the two, it's like the politician and the, you know, the leader and the, and, the, and the technocrat fighting between these things. That how can we do this? How can we become more engaged into this thing? And the Japanese were wondering, how do we balance this? And they said one of the interesting things they found in Europe is that how obsessed the Europeans were about keeping their identity. That they wanted to keep out foreigners, uh, this was 1870s, you know, and this thing is that, that, and they felt that the success of Europe came from the fact that they had a single race and they had a single language and they had a single religion. Now, this is what the Japanese took. I'm not saying it's, you know, but this is what the Japanese report comes down to. And you can see, you know, how easy it is for a government to say, yeah, this is a simple solution. You know, pure race, we're all of the same color, we're all of the same religion, we're all worshipping the same God, so therefore things will be better, which is why, you know, you see people like Modi in India bringing in religion, because we are all the same, and if you're not this, you should change, because, <coughs> you know, this is the only way to go forward. And so, 
we see them growing. You know, I mean, I, I don't really, I, I feel like crying because it's such a sad thing when you think about this type of people playing this. So how do you change societal attitudes, you know, and institutions, informal attitudes? South Africa is a good example. You know, I, I, you know, learning how things have changed in the last 30 years, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, but it's also been at high cost. It's not a, you know, the happiest of nations in many ways. You have many, many issues to go. Changing institutions, changing the way in which people interact with each other takes uh, generations, as you know. Um, and the Jap Japanese spent 150 years to get to where they were, to change their society. Uh, I, I, I can go on about it, but it was, it was, it was fundamental to this. And so firms are only looking for their own return. They're not looking to save you. They're doing CSR, they're doing all these type of things. Yeah, this is fine. But you have to save yourself in the end. And this is where leadership, the partnership with leadership, the partnership with, uh, uh, between the politicians and the leaders, and also being, not being short-sighted. Because one of the key arguments in Bismarck and, and the Kaiser was they kept complaining, the, the crown prince kept complaining that, that Bismarck did not understand the long-term consequences. I feel, but we look at Germany today, and it wasn't for, he did understand the long-term consequences. The long-term consequences, you know, Germany is, the way he engineered Germany is the way it is today. And the way the Japanese engineered Japan from the Iwakara embassy is roughly, you know, you can see a natural progression from there, but in a way that you have to recognize that there are costs, you have to think longer term, that we're not thinking one, you know, one generation, you're not making, Policies for six months, you're making policies for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, for 50 years. Where are we going to be? So this is really, for me, the, where the leadership comes in. You know, how do you come to accept that there are short-term costs? And how do you persuade your people to accept the short-term costs of what you're going to do? That, yes, you're going to... You're going to be miserable, but one day you'll be okay. One day or your children will be okay. This is not an easy thing to sell in a democracy. How do you sell this? You can't say, no, 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 don't worry. You will suffer. Your grandchildren will do fine. Yeah, just know that and feel happy and go to church. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's my talk. And I'm happy to have any kind of discussion you'd like. Thank you very much.